that's, you know, Algernon Sidney, when he was had his head cut off because he dared say that, you know, the your bloodline did not give you a, a divine right to rule over your fellows. You know, when he was on the scaffold, his his what he called his apology, he wrote the night before he was executed. He wrote, I know that my Redeemer lives. I know that dying defending the cause of liberty is going to go well for me on the other side. Whereas if I live, if I shut my mouth and just play ball, what's going to happen when I get in front of the Savior to be judged and I've lived a life of hypocrisy, a life of trading liberty for luxury? He's like, I'd rather die and know that my eternity is squared away than live another 20 years and really be dreading that face-to-face interview with Jesus. Hello and welcome to And If Love Remains. I'm your host, Mike Lovett, and I could not be more thrilled than to have this next guest on. Um, We have with us today in studio, the teacher of liberty himself, Mr. Dr. Joey Wolverton. And uh, good to have you. We're going to talk about his book. He is a constitutional attorney. He's a, a scholar, a writer. Um, he wrote the the real James Madison. He wrote uh, what manner of madness? What degree, what degree of madness? There we go. It was on the tip of my tongue. Um, and then the founder's recipe, which we're going to spend our, our time on today. Welcome to the show. Thanks for being on. Thank you, Mike. I I'm following some. Pretty heavy hitters. You had Jeffrey Tucker on and Mike Meharry. So yeah, yeah. Well, you know what? None bigger than you. <laughs> this is this. I'm th- I'm I've been. You know, I've been trying to get you back on. Yeah. So yeah. this has been. I'm glad our schedules could work out and we can make this happen. And Sorry. this is a this is a great book. And in our in our last conversation, you talked about this being your your magnus opus. This mm-hmm. was your life's work. And right. Talk to me about that. Like, talk to me about the origin story of the founder's recipe. Yeah, so uh, I think we talked about it a little bit last time. Um, when I went to college, um, I was a poli sci, ma- political science major, and uh, emphasis on the early republic. I don't know why people ask me why I was just, I have no idea. I just remember from my earliest days, something about the founding always intrigued me. And so I, I, I don't know why. I guess it, uh, something that came with me, I guess. And, um, so when I went to college, I chose that as my major, and man, day one, I knew I was in over my head. I was the first person on either side of my family to go to college, so I had no sort of heads up about what to expect, and when I got there, these kids knew more about the the founding than I did, and it was intimidating. I mean, they were talking about Federalist 10 this and Federalist 51 that, and I'm like, I don't even know what they are, right? Right. I literally did not know. And so uh, after a few days, I went to one of my professors, uh, Dick Vetterly, who's passed on now. And I said, Dr. Vetterly, I'm going to, I want you to know you're a great professor and an amazing man, but I'm, I'm dropping out because I, I just feel I'm too far behind. And he's like, well, you are far behind, but he's like, you're a smart kid. So let me tell you maybe a way, if you're willing to put in the hours, you can catch up to everybody. And he gave me a copy of the Federalist Papers, like a paperback, you know, trade paperback, just cheap copy. And he's like, so go to the index of this and write down everything in that index that you don't know what it is. And I'll just make the long story short. So obviously there's a ton of stuff. And then when I took the list to him, he's like, okay, now go to the library because it's days before the internet. Right. He's like, go to the library, look up those things. And at, when I did that, I brought it all back to him. And there was another professor there, uh, Lou Midgley. And some of the stuff they're like, I, you know, I don't even know what that is. Right. And that made me think, huh. what the heck? <laughs> and Dr. Vetterly wrote a book called Search for the Republic. That's just, man, it's worth its weight in gold. I still have my copy. You can probably find it on like a books or something. But anyway, that became the little tiny seed that became this because I, I started to realize that as I would read, you know, the hard copies of the the papers of Madison, of Jefferson, of Franklin, of Wilson, of Adams. 
that there were people that they were quoting a lot. And they were people that no one even knew about in my classes. In fact, some of my professors were like, I might have heard about him in grad school or something, but I, I don't know. I couldn't tell you what he wrote. Right. And so that became a little thing. And I'm like, if I want to understand why the founders did what they did, like, you know, anyone can open up a constitution and see what they did. I wanted to know why they did that. And so I figured if I want to know why they did what they did, my, it seems logical that I'll want to put in my head the things that were put in their head. So I read the books that they quoted. Mm. And years later, I found uh, on Liberty Fund site, I found that they had referenced a, uh, a survey that, or, you know, a survey of most influential writers on the founders uh, that they had done at, the, I think it was University of Houston had done in the, in the mid 80s. And so I took using the internet and increased the, the sample size and then just basically took that list and, and decided, man, every time I would talk about these things, people would say, where did you get that? Right. And I would say, oh, Algernon Sidney or, you know, Trenchard and Gordon or Caesar Beccaria. And they'd be like, what are you talking about? You know, <laughs> what kind of Greek is that? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, it's all Greek to me. And so I, yeah. And so that became, those guys became the things that I read and studied in order to understand what the founders were doing. You know, that it reminds me of a, of a, a book I read and I actually love, and I wish the authors I've lot called how to read a book. Okay. And the, like, the idea is that, you know, you read a book with a marker and a pencil right. and you yeah. go through and you, you've got in the point of a book is to, for the author to convey as you know, what he knows to you. And sometimes that deals with symbolism. Sometimes that deals with references mm -hmm. that he has to assume that you already know. And I think we lose so much of that. And, and, and I, I know for me in my history background, like when I, when I learned history growing up, it went like, uh, we'll talk American history. It's like 1602, right. To maybe like the, the, uh, uh, Indian, you know, uh, uh, French Indian war <laughs> to revolution yeah. to civil war. And there was nothing in between There's nothing. And there's no, there's no context. There's nothing. And so in order to understand what the founders are saying, you need to understand what they know. Yeah. I mean, I would read the federalist papers and they would say, well, as the Abbe de Mobley said, and I would be like, <laughs> what do you mean? As he said, like, like, a, and they would just paraphrase. Right. Or they would say, you know, Madison's like the celebrated Montesquieu said, and but he didn't have a quote. He and Hamilton quotes him, and there's Beccaria, and all these people are quoted. And I was like, man, if I really want to understand the Federalist Papers, I have to understand these guys whose works they are essentially distilling into these letters to the editor, which is what the Federalist Papers were. Right, and so. Today, when I hear people say, oh, if you want to understand the Constitution, you got to read the Federalist Papers, I'm like, yes, but I'm always afraid that they'll read them and not understand the context and maybe take something away from them that the founders didn't even intend because you don't understand the context, the references that they're making. And they're replete. With can, you, can you give an example of that? Like, where, where would be something that if somebody read in Federalist whatever and and – literally could take a, a different intention from just because they didn't understand the context of what the, the founders were talking about. Well, I, as far as like a, how you could take it the wrong way, I right. don't, I've not thought about that, but it would be like if in, in a couple of places in the Federalist, for example, they, they quote uh, a man named Gabriel Bonneau, but they call him the Abbe de Mobley. He Abbe meaning father. He was a priest. Okay. And Mobley was the area where he, his family was aristocrats. And so his name is Gabriel Bono, but they call him Mobley de Mobley and they quote him and they say these things. And it's like, I have seen myself people that will just, just what uh, Hugh Nibley used to call Teflon readers. Mm -hmm. You'll come across something you don't recognize and you just let it slide off. <laughs> right. And you miss. And so my thing was, and that's, and I did that myself at 18. I'm like, 
I don't want this stuff to slide off me. I want it to stick to me. I don't want to glaze over the paragraphs that they, you know, paraphrase from Mobley or that they paraphrase from Beccaria or that they paraphrase from Machiavelli. I mean, that's a guy, for example, Machiavelli. He's one of the big ones that when people read this book, they're they're shocked by the selections that I have from Machiavelli. Yes. Because first of all, the prince, yes, the founders read it, but they're they were much more interested in Machiavelli's discourses on Livy. So Livy was one of the guys that the founders loved. And Machiavelli read Livy and essentially kept notes. And then he he was so celebrated that they published those notes. And it's right. called Discourses on Livy. Well, Machiavelli, and if you Google him, everybody uses his name as a hiss and a byword. For sure. Right? It's like you're Machiavellian, meaning you will use power to get what you want. That isn't what he said. The first line, you know, the first, I don't know, chapter, book, whatever you want to call it, in The Prince even says, the best and the only sure way of holding on to power is through virtue. Right? And he goes on and on. He's like, but we know that people are just more attracted to vice. And so he says, if you find yourself in a position where you want power and, and he goes and explains both ways, but we only ever hear the one side, the one side of it. And so whenever it's, it's people, like reading, uh, uh, reading the, 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 uh, Oh, I, I, uh, um, it's like it's like reading about heaven and hell and only reading the hell parts. <laughs> yeah, and that's exactly right. You know, you read the the gospel or you study the plan of salvation, and it's like all you ever hear about is the devil. You never hear about Jesus, right? <laughs> you know, it's like yeah, I know enough to be scared of that dude, but you don't know there's something to be happy about, right? Yeah, and so that's the, and so people read it and they're like, oh, I had no idea that he would have these recommendations. In fact, his his sentiment is you should be a virtuous people and a virtuous leader, but history tells us that doesn't last very long. And so that's the sort of thing. And it just, and when they talk about war in the Federalist Papers, they're quoting Hugo Grotius. When they talk about in the constitutional convention, when they're talking about the relations among the states, they're using international law or what they called the law of nations because they saw themselves, and here's the thing, that Mobley, in his letters, he was became friendly with John Adams, became friends of John Adams, and in his letters, he would say, you know, um, the great advantage of the American uh, experiment is that you have not consolidated your 13 republics into one country. And so I have that selection for Mobley in the book, and that the founders believe you can read the Declaration of Independence. It says, right, we are now 13 states equal to the state of Great Britain. Right. Each of us, not right. one of us. Not, not one of us. Each of us is, is a state equal to the state of Great Britain. And so when they were at the convention, they were using rules of the laws of nations, which is something that they had from Emmerich Emer de Vaudel, something they had from Hugo Grotius. And when you, Mike, when you read these guys, and I, I tried to put the most salient part, mind you, you know, you're talking Hugo Grosch's work is, is a couple thousand pages, and I have like maybe five, right? right? So you're talking about, and that's what I say in the book. I'm like, this is, a, this is an amuse-bouche, right? Yeah. This is just to get you interested. Yeah. If you want to, you'd be better off going eating the full, the full menu. But when you realize that, suddenly you understand you're like, whoa, a lot of stuff in the Constitution that I thought was one way is actually another way. I mean, even the word Congress, right? Like, why did a bunch of British people not call their lawmaking body Parliament? Right, that's interesting, yeah. You would think they would. Mm -hmm. And why did they call it Congress? They didn't name it after Rome. Yes, they had the Senate after Rome, but they didn't call it, the Senate, they, they called it Congress. Well, when you study Emmerich de Vaudel, for example, he tells you Congress is the coming together of ambassadors from different republics or different interests, separate interests, who come together to discuss 
things that they have in common they need to sort out. But it each has his own republic's interest in mind. It's the UN of... <laughs> right, exactly. And they did that on purpose. They could have called it... They were all English. They could have called it parliament. They chose Congress on purpose. And when you learn that, suddenly you start to understand more about the government than you ever would have if you simply read the Federalist Papers and nothing else. Yeah. So so what, um, I mean, clearly you have this great passion that has, has just, you know, been burning in you. Yeah. What drove you to put this book together? It's such an interesting way how you've done it. it it's kind of, it's a textbook of sorts. Right. Um, what, what was the impetus? Like, like how long you've been thinking about the book itself and how you wanted to, to, uh, share these, these ideas. Well, I wanted to, when I, and I'm not going to go in the story of how this happened, but when I was, you know, hired to teach history at heritage Academy in Arizona, I knew that I wanted to teach kids because I, I was going to teach high school. I, I don't do well with younger kids. I don't, I don't know. I just don't know how to talk to them very well. And I, because I think they need a little more, you know, gummy bears and rainbows. Less Algernon and, Sydney. Right. <laughs> or even if they had Algernon Sydney, it'd have to be like a cartoon Sydney who, you know, and I'm more of, uh, you know, a Southern Baptist preacher. And so right. I knew I wanted to teach these kids these things. And so originally what I would do is I would just say, okay, um, we're going to assign you randomly one of these. 36 uh, books and you read through it and we'll just talk about it, you know, and you'll record your thoughts in a commonplace book like the founders did and like the Greeks and the Romans, you know, a little, uh, the Romans called it, you know, the, the Vade Mecum, the go with me, a little book you would carry and write down things you read that you wanted to remember. And so I had the kids do that. You're going to keep a commonplace book, which is what the, you know, our fathers called them and we'll read these books. And then it occurred to me, some of these kids are missing some stuff because they have a tendency, I'm just going to start at the beginning of a book. So they would start at the beginning, and sometimes they'd be like, I don't really get it. And so I thought, okay, next level. Why don't you look at the table of contents and choose a chapter that sounds interesting? Mm -hmm. That helped it a little more. And then I thought, you know what? I'm going to take all that I know, distill it into something uh, much much more easily digested right? and give it to them as a sort of turnkey. And I included in the book, the one you can buy from Amazon. It has blank lined blank pages at the end of each guy's selection so that you can take notes about what you just read, because for most people, most of it's going to be brand new. And so that's what brought the book about. I thought I want this to be something I could give to people to kids. Originally I thought kids, and now I realize just anybody who is genuinely interested in understanding the Anglo-American political philosophy. And so that became this book. And I was like, I want to make it pretty. Right. But I also want to make it not too lengthy. I don't want it to be the kind of thing that you look at this book and you're, you, you don't read it because you're like anticipatorily lazy. It's such a <laughs> thick book. You're like, yeah, I'll get to it, yeah. you know? And so it sits about 300 pages, including the, the, I, I wrote like a 33 page intro and, um, the, uh, the lined pages. And so it's just about 300 pages. And thanks to, uh, uh, Haley Hart creative is the company that designed it. And believe me, if, if it hadn't been for uh, Haley Hart Creative, this book, I don't think anyone would buy it the way I had it laid out. In a, <laughs> and oh, also my co-author, um, Addie Clough, who, man, she did a lot of the real yeoman's work on this, pulling together uh, sample quotes and that sort of thing and yeah. biographical info and where they were quoted by the founders and that sort of thing. So I thought... This is kind of a turnkey, just quick little taste of this. And I'm hopeful. And as I say in the intro, go and I put the names of the books and where you can find them. Go get them. And if any of this interests you, even if only one of them, 
go and read his whole thing, you know? Yeah. Don't just read the four or five pages I have in this book. Right, right. It's it, it, it's really, it, it's very, it is very accessible. The, the, um, uh, the, the pictures are gorgeous. Like, it's really well put together. And that's all the Haley Hart created. Yeah, it's, she, she designed it, you know, soup to nuts, honestly. It, it, it's really well done. Um, I want to talk about some of the content. And okay. I want to specifically ask you, first of all, um, I mean, this is kind of a life's work, so it's not a, a, maybe a fair question. But what would, what, what, um, let me just say first. So, so how the book is structured is that it is structured by person, mm -hmm. you know, and you have a little biography and then, and then some, some quotes and, and what their main ideas are. Um, what would somebody reading this book find maybe the most surprising characters in you, you mentioned Machiavellian. What are some, who are some other people that would be people like, well, wow. um, I think one of the ones I always talk about is Caesar Beccaria. Mm -hmm. So he's a top 10 influence on the founders in fact uh thomas jefferson when he was asked to craft the penal code for the state of kentucky um he based it on caesar beccaria's book of crimes and punishments and i think no i mean it it's been proven i teach a class i mean i i do it over zoom and in person i teach anybody that wants to you know, study the book with me. I, I think sometimes that helps, but um, people are always shocked by Caesar Beccaria. The, the things he says about what it means, why do we have things like a crime and why do we punish crime? And, <laughs> and when people start reading it, they're like, I have never thought about it that way, you know? And so Caesar Beccaria, um, John Trenchard and Thomas Gordon, those guys are straight savagery Every page, they wrote a thing called Cato's Letters. And they were letters, essays published in a London newspaper, 1720 to 1722. Okay. And they did one, pretty much one a week, and they are savage against every form of tyranny, every form of vice. And I, every time people are like, no wonder our founding fathers were willing to redeem the land by the shedding of blood when this these things in this book were taught to them you know were they ingested them with their mother's milk mm. you know and and that's the thing beyond the people that and you will you, you know you'll find emmerich devado who lays out the the confed the american confederation not calling it that he's simply saying in the history of the world, here's how confederacies work. And you find out, blimey, we're, we're, we're not one nation indivisible. We're 50 nations who have a few things in common right? and should work that out. And I think the, the takeaway that I love most is when someone reads the book and they're like, from the Greeks all the way to the Enlightenment, they, they're telling the same story. Right. And people are shocked. And I'm like, now you see how these men became who they were. The Madisons, the Jeffersons, the Washingtons, the Franklins. You see how they, John Adams, you see how they became who they are because now you're reading what they read. Mm -hmm. And they would read these things for the most part. Now, there's a few that are, you know, more or less contemporary with the founders, but for the most part, these would have been things they read as children, right? Uh, from about nine years old to about fifteen years old, they would right. have they would have read this stuff that today, you know, confuses professors of American history. And 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 that's actually an interesting question because I think you're right. I think I think the stuff that that um, that are portrayed or or. Let me let me try to phrase the question a little bit differently. Well, let me just ask you in this way: Why would professors of history today, in your standard American state-run college, find the things confusing, shocking um, that that you have in this book? 
Well, I think for a couple of reasons. Number one, when the federal government began to assert any sort of influence over education, which began, believe it or not, with Abraham Lincoln, um, the, the idea was if we let kids continue to read these things, then as soon as these kids are old enough to shake off chains of tyranny, they'll do it, even if it's at the point of a gun. Right. So these things were purposefully uh, removed from the curriculum of American schools by those who recognized the danger, right? If we teach these kids about these principles and these men become their heroes the way they were the heroes of the founding fathers, we're going to end up every time a tyrant starts to flex we're going to have a bunch of, you know, 20, 25-year-olds running them out of town. Right. Right. Because these so, are radicals. Like, the, the things that are being said are oh, radical. Yeah, absolutely. To the, absolutely. I mean, completely um, out of um, polite society. <laughs> yeah, but the thing is, if you, you know, I tell a story about James Madison when, you know, he, his family wasn't wealthy. Um, they, they had a lot of land, but they, they, they didn't have cash, like ready cash. And so his father couldn't hire a tutor just for James. So James ended up in a class with about 14 other kids in his, I say neighborhood, mind you, it was quite a large neighborhood, but in Virginia. Uh, and, you know, if you're 11 years old and you don't know who... John Trenchard and Thomas Gordon, if you can't quote Tacitus, you're, you know, you're looked down on. Today, if, if a, an American history professor knows anything about Trenchard and Gordon, I'm shocked, hmm. you know, and because of that, it, it's like, you know, it's like Jesus said, a house divided against itself can't stand. The very system that relies on your ignorance for its own perpetuation is not going to give you <laughs> the power to tear it down. Right. Right. And so, and I used to tell kids when I was in a brick and mortar school teaching this stuff that mind you, they only let me do the last couple of years. I had to do it secretly before that as a sort of sub curriculum. And I told the kids, I'm like, we're learning this stuff so you can pull this place down. Yeah. So that we can get back. You know, we want to have a Madison. Right. Right. But we don't do the things that created James Madison. You know, it's like I say in the book, we, we keep wanting, you know, there's this delicious cake called James Madison or George Washington. There's this delicious cake. And year after year, we wonder why there are no, no, nobody like that anymore. And because the recipe for that cake, we've been substituting salt for sugar and wondering why it ain't sweet anymore. Right. Well, there's a big reason. And I genuinely believe, and I know if you read the book, you'll understand the reason it is, is because these things are not taught anymore. And in fact, they're, they're so obscure today that even finding them and knowing what to read is nigh on impossible, which is another impetus for putting it in people's hands in a hard copy. Right. Yeah. That, I think it's, it's so valuable. Um, I want to talk about one character. Okay. Um, that I don't think people will be necessarily surprised that he was an influence on the founders, mm -hmm. but I think they might be surprised on the kind of influence he was. Mm -hmm. You know, we talk about religion today. It's almost like a club. You know, in a lot of in a lot of places. Um, but when we talk about um, St. Paul in um, from the Bible and we talk about his letters, his writings and how they influenced. Um, I don't think people let me put it differently. I don't think people realize what a radical and. Um, uh, 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 topple turvy turvy world Christianity brings to um, tyranny. I don't know if people really get like what what it means um, to have Caesar to have a, a person who was killed by Caesar rise again from the dead, <laughs> you know, and say, 
this doesn't work. Right. And we, you know, why was, why was Jesus uh, executed in the manner he was? Because crucifixion was the, was the prescribed Roman punishment for crimes against the state. Right. Jesus was there teaching that I don't, you know, I don't care about Caesar. My kingdom's not of this world. I'm going to tear the temple down and, you know, you want to, you want to give something, go get a fish and get something out of his mouth. I'm going to put, my father puts money in a fish's mouth. That's how concerned I am about your, your little status quo. Right. Well, that, that can't go on. And so when you, when you have Christianity is the end of Rome, Mm -hmm. right? And so Paul was perhaps Christianity's fieriest proponent. And there's a lot he said, and this is a man, Paul was a Roman citizen, Mm -hmm. which was very valuable back then. And, but he's a man who was imprisoned a lot and knew something about freedom, right? And so, yeah, he was often quoted for that, you know, I, the Lord God, made you free, and you are free indeed, and, you know, don't give up your freedom for anything. And, of course, they loved that. Right. You know, and it had, you know, it reminds me of uh, when de Tocqueville came to America in 1830 to sort of find out what made us tick. He said, you know, as when he got off the boat— in Rhode Island, he said, the first thing I smelled was the perfume of the Bible. Wow, yeah. He's like, everybody here can quote the Bible, and they own a Bible. He's like, do you know how many farmers in France own a Bible? He's like, and he tells a story, you know, he's in the middle of nowhere in West Tennessee in the forest, and he goes in this ramshackle cabin And he sees on the hearth the collected works of Milton, the collected works of Shakespeare, and the King James Bible. And he's like, this is a farmer who doesn't have two cents to rub together, but he can quote Virgil. And he's like, how did that happen? And so, you know, St. Paul, he, the, the founding fathers, they, they marinated in, in religion. It was very, it was not window dressing to them as it is for politicians today who hold Bibles upside down or have photo, you know, ops in front of churches. This is a guy who the first Sunday of the convention, Washington says, don't care what religion, let's all go together and let's just church hop according, you know, we'll go to the Presbyterians this time, the Methodists. They went to a Catholic church. They went together to church because they're like, it's Sunday, you go to church. Yeah. Well, and and I think um, the impo- I think one of the main things that Christianity brought is this idea that we are children of God. There's only one King, and that the most important person is the person that Jesus saved, which is the individual person. Mm-hmm. Not you know, He didn't save a country. He didn't save um, uh, uh, you know, a state. He saved a person, every person, and that kind of radical idea, like, as you said, you you can't have that and, and, and have tyranny like those two things. Cause, cause Christians are just going to be like, well, sorry, I, it's worth it to me to live in heaven than die a slave. Yeah. That's, you know, Algernon Sidney, when he was, had his head cut off because he dared say that, you know, the, your bloodline did not give you a, a divine right to rule over your fellows. You know, when he was on the scaffold, his, his, what he called his apology, he wrote the night before he was executed, he wrote something he called the apology, and which means defense, right? In right. Greek, it means the, the word in favor of a defense. And so he said, you know, I know that my Redeemer lives. That's a direct quote. And he said, I know that dying, defending the cause of liberty is going to go well for me on the other side. Whereas if I live, if I shut my mouth and just play ball, what's going to happen when I get in front of the Savior to be judged and I've lived a life of hypocrisy, Mm -hmm. a life of trading liberty for luxury? He's like, I'd rather die and know that my eternity is squared away than live another 20 years 
and really be dreading that face-to-face interview with Jesus. Wow. Yeah. That's sobering. And it's when you, I guess if you, if you're a true believer, like if the, if you actually believe that as I believe the founders did, that is going to affect how you act. That's going to, that's going to make you write things in the declaration that say things like here are the things that the Kings did against us. We're a free people. You cannot do this. And therefore your rule is null and void in our mind. Right. I mean, when Jefferson writes, uh, you know, all men are created equal and are endowed by their creator. He, he means that he's not speaking equality the way 21st century people think of it. What he's saying is no one is born with a natural right to rule over another man. Mm -hmm. And so if you have, and he gets this right from Sydney and he admits this Jefferson and I have the quote in the book. I, I should read it rather than paraphrase it, which is what I, I always paraphrase. While, you, while you're looking at that, yeah, this, go on. this is, I just want to say, I, we're talking to Dr. Joe Wolverton. We're talking about his book, the founder's recipe. Um, it's a, it's a book that will give you um, maybe not the full feast, but you'll give you a taste of what the founders understood and, and allow you to understand where they were coming from as, as they, embarked on this great experiment of the Republic. Yeah. I mean, it's kind of a good, better, best thing, Mike. I mean, reading the book is good, right? Going and reading more is better. Reading all of them in full is best. Right. But obviously not everybody has that kind of time. But anyway, this is uh, Jefferson talking about Algernon Sidney. Uh, the world has so long and so generally sounded the praises of his discourses on government that it seems superfluous and even presumptuous for an individual to add his feeble breath to the gale. They are in truth a rich treasure of Republican principles supported by copious and cogent arguments and adorned with the finest flowers of science. It is probably the best elementary book of the principles of government as founded in natural right, which has ever been published in any language. And it is much to be desired in a government as ours that it should be put into the hands of our youth as soon as their minds are sufficiently matured for that branch of study. Wow. And and what and and, 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 that Sydney book, and what was, I was gonna say what what yeah, that so book what said, how did it get distilled into the declaration? Yeah. Sydney says there is only if we're all created by God and we're all equal, which we are, right, he says, right. there are only two ways a man gets power over another man force or consent. Period. Right. So if you didn't consent to what this man is having you do, one way or another, he's enslaving you. And by doing that, you are insulting that God who vouchsafed your liberty through the shedding of the blood of his son. That's how clear it was to him. Right. God made you free. You're trading that freedom for whatever, safety, luxury, ease of life, whatever you're doing. You're, to Sidney's way of thinking and to you know the majority of the founders, what you're doing is saying to God, uh, you know, yes, it, it, it's nice, but it's not as valuable as whatever my safety. Wow. That's like, if you actually take that again, if you become a true believer, if you actually like take that into your soul, that's, that's life changing stuff. Well, it, it, the, you know, I would, I teach it. I, the founding fathers, they did not place themselves in a position to be killed in brutal ways in, in an 18th century battlefield facing an army. They didn't even have an army, let's be honest, compared to the army. The army, the British, they weren't the greatest, most powerful army at the time, but compared to the American, we didn't have a canoe, we didn't have a cannon. Right. You know, they had a, a navy that could, They you know, were our army. Yeah, exactly, right? <laughs> yeah, lots of that was bought with our money. But yeah. um, you, you have 
Here's the deal. They, they didn't go to war over no taxation without representation. Rubbish. Mm -hmm. They did not go to war over that. What they went to war is this. And one of the guys at Lexington, when he writes his memoirs, The Battle of Lexington, he's like, I was free. They took that from me. I was determined to get it back, period. And the way it's explained is the first, great, the first commandment of the Ten Commandments, thou shalt have no other God before me. God, what's the one thing God does not do is come down and force you to choose to live as he would have you live. He wants you to, but he would never force you to live a certain way. He allows you the will, the freedom, the agency, whatever you want to call it, to choose to follow him, and he blesses those who so do. However, there is zero, zero coercion. So if you take that commandment, no other gods before me, take the fact of his personality that he would never force you to choose what is even best for you, and then you have a man who does force you to do what he says is best for you, if you follow that man, then you are placing that man above God, and you're violating the commandments. You are saying, sacrificing what God gave me right. to this man is okay. Now, there, there's some that would say that, you know, uh, government— um, can be ordained of God. In other words, there's a purpose for government. There's a there's a mm, purpose and, and a and a reason, and um, that um, uh, you know um, that we should be obedient to these kings. And you know, there's there are some who would say that. What what would what would the founders not? What would Joe Wolverton? Yeah, what would the, what would the founders say? Well, that what kind the, of philosophy? What, that's what you'll read in these. You know, the particularly the uh, the English guys that the founders, you know, Trenchard and Gordon, Algernon Sidney, John Milton, uh, you read those guys and they're, they're straight firebrands. They're straight savage. And they, they're like, so you're telling me that God who has, you know, who is the perfect being and demands love, right? His son taught, you know, the second great commandment is love thy neighbor as thyself. You're telling me that that God would enjoin you to support a Caligula, to support a Nero, to support a, a Caesar who murdered or enslaved a million Gauls. You're telling me, God, that's his plan? Because if that were his plan, his gospel makes no sense at all. Turning Jesus into a charlatan hmm. or, or a liar. Because if he's commanding you to do these things and you're you're also saying at the same time he's commanding you to be obedient to evil. Right. That, that doesn't make any sense at all. Right. And so they say, yes, God, yes, he ordains government in the sense that we are as political animals, as Aristotle would say. We, we live in societies, and that's good for us. We're not, we're not people who can survive on our own, really. We're sort of altricial in that way. We depend on each other, but— a government to be even to qual you know understand mike this is the thing there is to the founders there's no such thing as bad government there's government and tyranny mm. government to be called government must be good and to be good it must be based on the consent of the governed and must protect their property and their persons from each other wow yeah and that's it. The minute you start, and Jefferson said it in the Declaration, right? the minute you start instead of protecting my property and you start destroying it, you're, you're not the government anymore. You're a tyrant because government, to be government, must be good and to be a law the same way. And Cicero, that's the thing, you know, Cicero, man, he lays that out so clearly that if it's not for you know, if it's not for your good, that's not a law. That's that's some dictate of a tyrant. Right. You can choose to follow him, but don't don't fool yourself into saying you're being noble and obeying the law. And I think Cicero is an interesting example. Uh, you know, the founders are kind of like on one end of the of of the republic. 
you know, the beginnings and, and, and Cicero is kind of like an R end of the re- yeah. <laughs> Republic, you know? Oh yeah. I mean, he, that's a dude who got his hands cut off and his tongue cut out for the things he said about the tyranny of Mark Antony. Hmm. Yeah. What it takes me to kind of my next point. Um, talk to us about, um, as you've done your studies and, and I don't want you to like, you know, pick, pick your children, yeah, yeah, <laughs> but, yeah. but who have become some of your heroes and why, like who are these people have, have really, um, uh, resonated with you personally. And why is that? That man, you, you know, I'll, I'll just say this parenthetically listening to Jeffrey Tucker, who I admire so much and, and Mike Meharry, who I admire so much. You know, I heard both of them say at several times during your interview with them, wow, that's a great question. And this question you just asked me is a great question. That's a, a, a genuine question uh, that makes you say, wow, that's, that's something I like answering, you know. Um, Thank you. So, here, oh, gosh, man. You know, anybody who knows me right now, they're saying, if, this, if Joey doesn't say Sydney, right. then he's a big fat liar, right? <laughs> well, you've already mentioned him, I right. don't know, yeah. about a third, third of this. <laughs> yeah, so as I'm looking, I'm look, so I'm on page like two and three where I list the guys. And mind you, I remember the night that Haley, uh, you know, the, the lady Haley Hart creative that did this. I remember the night she sent me this and I was like, oh my gosh, it's so beautiful. So <laughs> it I is would, beautiful. Yeah, yes. I would say uh, Caesar Beccaria, uh, Trenchard and Gordon, Samuel Pufendorf, uh, Cicero, Hugo Grotius, Richard Price. Oh my gosh! You know, here's a guy who doesn't get enough pub, even from me. And every year when we study this guy, kids are like, "Whoa!" Yeah, because he's talking about what does it really mean to love your country. And I put a significant part of that essay in the book. Uh, so he's a guy, um, Livy Milton. People think Milton's Paradise Lost. Guys, Milton wrote a book called Areopagitica that nearly got him executed. Really? Oh, he wrote a book on ty- uh, on tyranny. Yeah, and he was right there in line with, you know, he lived before Sydney, but he was right there. Milton was known as a dude who, he was ready to, you know, make guillotines great again um <laughs> and let's see who else um oh emmerich de Vottle, algernon sydney yeah those are the guys that if i had to take and make sort of an, an abridged version right those are the guys well, i would put and I, and I guess i guess i guess what i'm trying to get at is like i i think um i think everybody has a, a certain um flavor you know like like something's gonna gonna dig into them and, and is going to um really reach out and go and and say man now i get it mm-hmm. right there's gonna there's, there's gonna be some point during a, a journey of any kind of intellectual sort where where something clicks and you go oh now this was the key that unlocked the door was there was there something like that for you oh absolutely you know people say to me all the time how difficult some of this is for them because it requires them to, as, you know, Faulkner would say, you know, kill some of their darlings. Yeah. And I, don't get it twisted. And I tell people this, I'm like, I, I was there too, man. I, I was raised in a house that every war the United States, you know, anytime we bomb someone, good. USA, USA, you know, and uh, every... If the Republicans won, that was good, and Democrats bad. And I was raised that way. And then it's like, so when I started to read these things, and I remember one of the big ones that hit me was Thomas Gordon wrote on his own, he wrote a uh, an essay on political parties. And when I read that, I, I, I'm like, no wonder. Washington in his farewell address said what he said. Yeah. No wonder Madison said that, you know, this was the the disease that had killed all the former. It all came from Thomas Gordon. Well, I'm not saying I mean, that I mean, all I mean, the, of it did. In my right. in my case, when I read it, and yeah, then of course that makes sense. They yeah. all and then you read uh all but they Mike, well, this is the thing. They all say the same thing. Political 
Samuel Pufendorf is a hero of mine, uh, a German guy whose name is Pufendorf, which, <laughs> you know, people are like, oh, that's a terrible name. Why did he, ch-? I mean, that's his surname, y'all. He didn't choose, <laughs> you know, his mama didn't that's right, hate him. Harry you Potter. Know? Right. So Pufendorf, he says, what happens when these parties get in, get in control of your, of your commonwealth? They... They quit thinking rationally, mm-hmm. and all they want to do is ruin the other guys. Yeah, They stop caring at all what's best for the Commonwealth. I just want to hurt the other party. And, and if you don't want to look at, like, American political parties, I mean, I'm happy to do that. But like, if, if you feel like you want to see an extreme example, just look at any communist party. Like, party over country, party over family, party. I mean, it is the party. That is your religion, and 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 it's not going to get to go against the party is is to go against the state. And right, and they and Trenchard and Gordon in Cato's letters and Thomas Gordon in his essay, he he makes that very clear. And don't get me wrong, Sidney says the same thing. Pufendorf says the same thing. Milton says the same thing. All Beccaria has even a thing on it. All of these guys say the same thing, which is why in the Federalist, it, it, to me, as I read through the, some of them um they talk more about factions mm-hmm. than they do about kings you know it's, oh yeah it's 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 mob rule and factions mm-hmm. and all these things that that are going to be the downfall to the republic right and uh, you know madison's great innovation was saying because all of these guys will tell you if you want to have a a, a an enduring republic it has to be small Madison's innovation was, what if we made it so big that no party could take control? Now, in my book that I wrote previously is What Degree of Madness, that's Madison in Federalist 46 saying, you know, we're different people as Americans. We're more virtuous and more educated. This will never happen to us. But he says, but assume we go so crazy. What degree of madness? Here's the you know, here's the solution to it. And so even Madison, although he says, let's make this extended commercial republic, he says, but in case something goes wrong, and what went wrong? What went wrong is we just quit caring about our liberty. And why? Because we allowed the the, the plutocrats to make it so comfortable on the plantation. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. And and to this day, it's, it's the same problem. Well, you know, yeah. fundamentally. Oh, absolutely. And, you know, that's it's shocking that we could have a situation where, you know, have you ever heard that story of Hobson's choice? I yes. I, yeah. So the guy Hobson had a livery stable in England. Right. Right. And you would go and he would say, you can have any horse in the stable as long as it's one of these two. Right. Right. right? Yes. And that or actually, you know, and so that's what we're at in America. It's like you can vote for anyone. But you, you're right. wasting your vote unless you vote for one of these two. It's a Hobson's choice. And you find just like, I'm telling you, if you read, for example, just that essay by Thomas Gordon where he says, look, here's what's going to happen. There, well, I, did, I should say even Aristotle. Aristotle in his politics, book politics, says, you realize that it's going to be the, these people that are apparently two ends of this political spectrum are eventually going to realize, hey, if we team up, we can sap the strength of those who create. Yeah. And let's take their property. Let's make that where they can't. Let's make them ignorant. Let's, I mean, I have a video on my channel about that because Aristotle just lays it out. Here's what happens. And we're just living it. Yeah. It, and I will say that another, another um, this book, the Founder's Recipe. By the way, there'll be links in, in the show notes on for Amazon, so get it. It's a, huge, it's a great book for the coffee table, but it's a better book next year, bed <laughs> yeah, table. Yeah. Um, it is like the underground of Western thinking from the Greeks to today. It's 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 the people you've never heard. So there's a few that you have heard of, but it's the people you never heard of that actually have, in my opinion, as I've read through these things, have um, been the innovation of liberty and moving these things forward. Is, is that a fair assessment? Oh, uh, well, yes. People say that to me. They're like, these are such so revolutionary. 
to us, they sound revolutionary. Right. But this is the stuff that our, that generation upon generation upon generation of, of, you know, Europeans and Englishmen and Americans were raised on. This is, these were things that it didn't seem reactionary or incendiary to say if a tyrant rules with bloodshed, it's much more moral and humane to kill him than to allow him to continue killing millions. Hmm. I mean, Trenchard and Gordon make a very clear point. They say, you say that killing a tyrant is bloodthirsty, but what if we can stop the shedding of a blood of, you know, a hundred thousand, a million people through this, of innocent people, Right. Who a good number are going to be completely innocent. If we can do that by shedding the blood of one guilty man, how is that somehow less humane? And and so that didn't sound radical to them. To us, it's like, oh, I mean, I have people on Facebook when I put these quotes on, they're like, <laughs> you're saying we, and this is funny. I, I did it the other day. Someone said, you're, what you're suggesting is we should, uh, we should kill you know we should assassinate the members of congress and i said no i i said we should kill tyrants you're the one who associated congress with tyrants <laughs> right maybe the you know secret service <laughs> should investigate you all i said was make guillotines great again let's throw the congressman in a hunger game situation yeah. and you or i said let's throw tyrants in, in a, a hunger game, game situation. and you said i can't believe you want congressmen to fight in the hunger games I didn't say that. You said that. I said yeah. tyrants. Yeah. So in your mind, you must know you that know. congressmen are tyrants. I, and um, and and so let's let's uh, maybe finish on on this point, or or um, finish on this general point. Um, I do think, like, if this is if this is the 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 the, the thinking of Western philosophy that that have really, and I hate to even say are who we are because it's not who we are anymore in a lot right. of ways. But um, how is this information and how does this make it pertinent to today? And I, I, I honestly, like, as I'm, as I'm thinking, I'm stumbling a little bit because I'm just thinking of, I'll tell you what I'm thinking. I'm thinking of the generations from Adam that have looked for a time um, and have talked about a time when there would be a free people, when they can make their own decisions and they could choose God or they can choose how they want to live. And we had that. Um, and, and literally pointing to our day, like literally like mm -hmm. there would there, if these ideas get passed to child, a child, a child, someday we'll pull the tyrants down. And we did. And I feel like that is like that whole, um, heritage is slipping away. Um, and I think this book is, is a solution. So, um, it's more of a statement than anything, but I'm curious to, you know, your thoughts on, on, on that and. Yeah, people often say, you know, this is a little inside baseball, Joey. I mean, I get that Madison and Jefferson and Adams read these guys, but what that's great for 17, you know, 75 or whatever, but what does that have to do with 2021 and or 2020? And my point is just start reading it, man. The minute you start reading this stuff, just the selections that I put in the book you'll understand from Jump Street what this has to do with us because we're essentially at a point where it's like um, a different Cato, the anti-federalist who wrote as Cato, and I would encourage you all to read this, the Cato, the anti-federalist Cato number five. He says, look, here's the deal. You can either restore your liberty and protect it through a little bit of prudence and wisdom, or you can fail to do that 
And by failing to do that little bit that you could do with wisdom and prudence, you will require thereby your children to wade through seas of blood to get back what you could have given them as a patrimony had you just been a little more courageous. And that guy's, you know, words echo in my mind all the time that, man, we really, really blew it. And when I say, you know, something I say that people kind of, they, they do a double take on is, Tyrants don't create tyranny. Obedience to tyrants creates tyranny. And that's on us because we, for now, for many generations, and I have a whole theory on this that is beyond the scope of this, but we've decided that a comfortable enslavement is fine with us because. We've been now for some 200 years allowed to eat the fruit of trees we didn't plant, drink water from wells we didn't dig. And now we've gone so far in that, that we don't even take care of the trees or take care of the wells. And that's okay for us. We're fine with that. And I, you know, I can't help but think, as Sidney, you know, says, I, you know, I know that my Redeemer lives. A famous quote he said when the, the judge in his trial said, you're just talking nonsense, Colonel Sidney. He was a colonel in the army at one point. You're talking nonsense, Colonel Sidney. He's like, I think you're just, I think the fact that you're on trial has just got you rattled. And Algernon Sidney famously holds out his arm and says, feel my pulse. I'm calm. Because I know that when I sit face to face with the Savior, he's going to be proud of what I've done. Can you say the same? And so that's the thing that to me, and uh, if you don't mind, can I just read a little thing Please, here? Please, yeah. Just to kind of end it. I know, man, when I, you know, half my family are, are preachers, and when I get going, I, I forget the, the half that aren't, and I just start channeling the half that are. <laughs> My well, dad would drive to church, and we'd go by this one church, and uh, he would say, look, man, I can drop you off there, pick you up when I'm done, and you can have a few hundred dollars by the time. <laughs> and so he says, uh, this is Trenchard and Gordon, their letter number, Cato's letter number 69, and they say, it lies upon you, gentlemen, to give motion to the machine. You are the springs that give life to all virtuous resolutions. Such as you show yourselves, so will be your representatives. Such is the tree, such will be the fruit. Choose honest men, free and independent men, and they will act honestly for the public interest, which is your interest. But it is not to be expected, friends that criminals will destroy their own handiwork or that they will reform or punish themselves or that men who have brought our misfortune upon us will go about in good earnest to redress them. Such deep wounds must be probed and searched to the core before they can be cured. And those who inflicted those wounds can seldom bear to see the operation, much less would they pay for the cure if they're at ease with the death of the patient. And they conclude, Now therefore, my best friends, this is the time to help yourselves. Now act honestly and boldly for liberty or forget the glorious and charming sound of it. Exactly 300 years ago. Dr. Joe Wolverton, thank you for being on the show. Let's have you again, okay? Yes, sir. Anytime. This is And If Love Remains. <laughs>